Welcome back again, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode, Guangzhou Part 3 today. Last time we convened, we ended with the Song Dynasty falling hard for the second time. First, it was in the 1120s with Emperor Huizong in the north when the capital was at Kaifeng. And for the second time, the Song Dynasty, reestablished in the southern half of China, suffered another bitter ending. And the bitterest part of the ending happened not too far from Guangzhou, southwest of the city. After the Mongol conquest in 1277, Kublai Khan had China divided up into provinces, and Guangzhou and all of Guangdong became part of the new Jiangxi province, Jiangxi Xingsheng, with the capital at Nanchang. The Mongol general Sodu had occupied the city of Guangzhou in 1278, a year before the final Song emperor met his watery end at the cliffs of Yaman. The role of Guangzhou as a southern gateway to China and as a port of trade was kept alive during the Yuan dynasty. Both Kublai Khan, his children, and grandchildren, they all had the same lust for the treasures and luxuries traded at all the maritime Silk Road ports and beyond. In this way, they weren't much different from previous emperors and royal courts. Government offices were established in Guangzhou and other places to regulate and manage trade and shipbuilding. And throughout the Yuan Dynasty, Guangzhou played its traditional role as a trade entrepot. The only thing was, it wasn't the main port anymore. We saw last time, due to the trouble and violence that visited Guangzhou in 758 and 879, the business migrated elsewhere. During the Yuan, Guangzhou's importance and the volume of the trade transacted there was a distant second to that being carried out at the southern Fujian port of Quanzhou, or Zaitan, as the Arabs named it back in the Tang and as Marco Polo referred to it in his travels. Kublai Khan and his progeny were famously accepting of people from other cultures and tolerant of their religions. I mentioned last time how the southern Song government, for reasons of its own economic survival, put so much effort in promoting maritime trade. And they depended on an armada of private traders who engaged in this endeavor. The Yuan rulers, with all those nice southern Song winds blowing in their sails from the advancements made in transport and navigation— replace the private trading networks with a government-run maritime trade network. And these Yuan vessels sail to all the South Sea ports, to India, as well as to the west coast of Africa, the Persian Gulf, and Red Sea. The Mongols, from all their conquests of the 12th to 14th centuries, knew a thing or two about the world and had seen and experienced a lot. And thanks to the central government's active sponsorship and participation, maritime trade during the Yuan reached new heights never seen before in China. And for the first time since the Han Dynasty, maritime trade eclipsed that of the traditional Inner Asian and Middle Eastern overland Silk Road commerce. And it was the advancements in sea trade of the Southern Song, taken to greater heights during the Yuan Dynasty, that really prime the pump for the seven voyages of Zheng He during the early Ming. These greatly heralded voyages of Zheng He didn't contribute anything new as far as exploration went. They simply followed all the long established trade routes that had been around seemingly forever. And wherever these treasure ships and other vessels sailed, colonization and subjugation was hardly on anyone's mind. As I mentioned last time, the Mongol conquest had the same effect on the people of northern China as the 5th century Wuhu Five Barbarians and the 12th century Jurchens. These periods of foreign occupation in the north of China gave rise to great migrations to safer lands in the south of the country. And Guangzhou and the greater Guangdong province were one such popular destination Although the Song Dynasty was where Guangdong province started to bulk up, it was really during the Yuan Dynasty when the population there started to swell and begin its steady march in the direction of the present-day figure of 126 million people. But as far as Guangzhou playing its traditional front-and-center role as the maritime commercial gateway to China, 
For the meantime, they played a secondary role, and the greater story of the Maritime Silk Road was played out in Chenzhou. But as we'll see, all that will change come the Ming and Qing dynasties. In the city of Guangzhou during the Yuan, Huaisheng Mosque received a much-needed rebuilding in 1350, and then again in the Qing in 1695. There was also massive expansion of the city walls that was finished in 1380 during the time of the Ming Hongwu era. These ancient city walls will mostly get torn down in the early 20th century, but you could still see portions that have been preserved. Parts of these Guangzhou city walls were 20 feet thick and 25 feet high. From 1351 to 1368, the Red Turban Rebellion brought a degree of chaos and uncertainty to China that ultimately swept away the once invincible Mongol Yuan dynasty and led to a historic showdown between the most powerful of the Red Turban rebel leaders. And it was one of these men, Zhu Yuanzhang, who made his way south and conquered the region after first vanquishing his greatest rival at the epic Battle of Lake Poyang. Towards the end of the Yuan, the vice minister of Guangdong was named He Zhen, and he was born and raised in the city of Dongguan, just east of Guangzhou. He had fought rebels and pirates down in Guangzhou on behalf of the final Yuan emperor, Huizong, and rose up to become the highest ranking and most powerful official in the south of China. And once Zhu Yuanzhang's conquest of China neared its completion in 1368, He Zhen correctly read the tea leaves and turned his back on the Mongols and submitted to the future Hongwu emperor. And for this, he was rewarded with a hereditary title and lived out the remainder of his days as the Count of Dongguan and is remembered as He Zhen Bo, Bo meaning both uncle, eldest among brothers, as well as a count, like Count Dracula. And with the fall of the Yuan and the rise of the Ming, thus began Guangzhou's return to prominence as the most important commercial port in China. But this wasn't to last. Unlike previous dynasties that actively encouraged trade, the Hongwu Emperor, he focused more on the downside rather than the merits of foreign trade. And from previous CHP episodes, we all know he became so fed up with the piracy plaguing the China coast, he called for the first of several sea bans, or Hai Jin, in 1371, three years into his reign. The effects of these extreme measures had quite a profound and devastating effect on Guangzhou, Quanzhou, and all China ports where trade was carried out. After these places were closed down, well, it didn't mean the death of foreign commerce. Those who traded outside the tribute system, despite the harsh punishments if caught, resorted to smuggling and other illegitimate means to carry on their business. Private traders had to take a huge hit, and the Ming government under the Hongwu and especially Yongle emperors only permitted government-regulated tribute trade, including the magnificent but extremely expensive voyages of Admiral Zheng He. So after so many centuries of the Nanhai trade and all the benefits that the Maritime Silk Road bestowed on the China economy and the sustained impact on Guangzhou's history and development, that all got shuttered by the Hongwu Emperor and didn't start to revive until after the last of Zheng He's voyages that happened between 1405 and 1433. And this whole idea of a sea ban in the end was considered a colossal failure in a case of the dynasty shooting itself in the foot, economically that is. As I just said, unofficial trade and smuggling continued on unabated, but that hardly enriched the Ming treasury. But this was all prelude to the events that happened in the final years of the 15th century. These events and the aftermath would one day create a radioactive cloud that still lasts into our day, left over from the history we'll discuss now, that unfolded mostly down in the Pearl River Delta region between the 16th and 19th centuries. It all started with Prince Henry the Navigator exploring the West African coast, looking for gold and slaves. And following that was Vasco da Gama's 1497 to 1499 voyage to India via the Cape of Good Hope, or Cape of Storms. Once the Portuguese explorers figured out how to sail from Lisbon to Asia, 
This set in motion all the events, both celebrated and despised in our day, of direct maritime trade between the Europeans and Chinese. And this, more than anything else, defined the history of Guangzhou for the next four centuries. The first Portuguese to arrive were passengers on other vessels. Georgi Alvarez is called the first European to come to China in modern times. This was in 1513 when it's believed his vessel arrived at Lingding Island in the Pearl River estuary, about midway between Zhuhai and Shenzhen, off the coast of present-day Tun Moon in Hong Kong. You see a lot of these... Ming-era accounts by these earliest Europeans to make landfall in China were written in Portuguese. And when it came time to transliterate the Chinese words into Portuguese, well, the accuracy of the place names often involved a degree of guesswork. But that's where it started. It wasn't that long after Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape that, in 1510, Goa in India and Malacca in today's Malaysia the following year became Portuguese outposts. No one invited them to these long-established and very mature trading ports. They just came in and took the places over. They had much better weapons and firepower than anyone in this part of the globe, and that's usually all you need. So that was a harbinger of further actions yet to come. This 1513 visit by Alvarez led to a visit to Guangzhou of an Italian, Raphael Perestrello, in 1516-1517. He was distantly related to Christopher Columbus. Perestrello did a bit of trade whilst in Guangzhou, and like Zhang Qian did in the late 2nd century BC with Han Emperor Wu, Perestrello went back and informed his Portuguese employers about the market conditions there and the riches to be made in the China trade, and most of all, the trade in spices. The sea ban put in place by the Hongwu Emperor began to loosen up a bit, and some private trade was allowed, but was limited to Guangdong province. This set things up nicely for the first official trade mission flying the Portuguese flag. And this was in 1517, the year that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses onto the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. And it was this mission, led by Ferno Perez de Andrade and Tome Perez, that set in motion the events that followed. The Portuguese learned from the voyages of Alvarez and Perestrello that there was gold in them hills, and now with this 1517 mission, these first Europeans had their eyes on the prize and were determined to establish direct trade relations with the Chinese, whether they wanted it or not. Eight vessels left the port of Malacca and headed towards the South China coast. Four were Portuguese and four were Malay. And when they got as far as the South China coast, near Guangzhou... Eh, things didn't go so smooth, but Andrade finally was able to receive an invitation to come trade at Guangzhou. And when they sailed within sight of the city, Andrade freaked everyone out by firing one of his cannon in salute. The first of many cultural blunders to occur on the European and Chinese sides. By the following year, 1518, the waters had been sufficiently calmed whereby trade was able to be carried out. The following year, Andrade's brother, Simo, showed up in Guangzhou to take over command of the trading operations. This man, Simo de Andrade, he checked just about every box of European outrageousness, and through his actions and heavy-handed, ham-fisted ways of diplomacy, turned the Chinese authorities and officials against Portugal. One misunderstanding after another fueled the anti-Portuguese feelings of everyone concerned. Finally, the government expelled Simo de Andrade and all the Portuguese from Guangzhou in 1521 after rumors circulated that they were buying Chinese children to eat them. Between their own ignorance of the accepted trading norms, not to mention the Portuguese abhorrence of Muslims, between 1521 and 1522, the Portuguese traders managed to make a fine mess of things, stoking horrible anti-Western feelings on the part of the Chinese, who were flabbergasted at the behavior of these people. The Chinese authorities all along, seeing the riffraff that manned Portuguese vessels, viewed them as pirates and not as representatives of a sovereign nation. You see, trade had 
always existed in one form or another between Europe and China going back to the time of the Caesars. But because there was no Suez Canal yet, there was no easy way to sail from the Mediterranean Sea to the South China Sea. Therefore, much to the delight of Arab, Jewish, and Persian merchants, trade was all done through a network of middlemen. And although Europeans knew about China, everything they knew came second and third hand. And thanks to limitations in navigation, distance, the protectionism of established traders, not wanting to upset their profitable trade networks, Europe and China were always kept apart and had never engaged in direct trade or met face-to-face. And both places, China and Europe, from the Han Dynasty onwards, developed into very powerful and advanced civilizations. And now, only for the first time in the 1520s, these two civilizations came crashing into one another, each assured of their own superiority over the other. There were no filters anymore or middlemen to smooth out the sharpness and rough edges of direct trade. And these early visits from these Portuguese adventurers kind of set the tone for the next few centuries. It could have gone either way, but thanks to this first outing, it went the way of antagonism. And so began the slow and steady march towards 1842. The Portuguese had been expelled from the Pearl River Delta, but that didn't mean they gave up and went home. They sailed east and north up the China coast and began trading at Xiamen and Ningbo. For many in China, everything was strictly business. What the Portuguese and Chinese thought of each other took a back seat to raking in the considerable profits from buying and selling. But down in Guangzhou, despite sincere entreaties from other Portuguese to engage in trade, none was allowed to take place, and this state of affairs lasted for decades. And when Portuguese representatives attempted to open the door and got too close to Guangzhou, sparks flew, and each time the outcome was unfavorable for Portugal. In situations like this, the only other option was to resort to smuggling and other means to get their hands on the silk, spices, and porcelain. And all the while, piracy along the China coast was rife. It affected both foreign ships and the people who lived on the China coast. And this ended up presenting an opportunity for the Portuguese, who offered their services and advanced firepower to the local governments to help them in their fight against the pirates. And so well did the Portuguese do in tamping down this menace. By 1549, they got in good once again with the Chinese authorities and were allowed to trade. It was cloaked in the form of tribute trade, but in business, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And this is what ultimately led to the deal that allowed the Portuguese to establish a permanent settlement in Macau in 1557. Up to then, the traders from elsewhere in South and Southeast Asia based themselves on the many offshore islands near Guangzhou, and that's how trade was carried out. The officials at Guangzhou knew how lucrative the trade was with these forlangis, as the Portuguese were called. This word came from the Persian word farang. By hustling all these Portuguese into the tiny enclave of Macau, it kept them close enough to trade with China exporters, but far enough away from Guangzhou, whereby they couldn't cause too much trouble. A wall would later be built that separated the north of Macau from China. And such were the circumstances. The Portuguese inside Macau were completely dependent on China for food, water, and provisions. And this arrangement worked quite well for a while. Word travels fast whenever it comes to ways to make money. The Spanish tried to replicate the success of their neighbors in Portugal, but in 1573 they got chased away and henceforth had to carry out their China trade from their base in Manila. The Dutch also, they got wind of what the Portuguese were up to, and they also tried to force their way in the door. They came in 1601, but didn't have much success. Not down in Guangzhou, anyway. They sailed up the coast to Fujian, determined to establish trade relations with China. By 1624, they'll be kicked out of their settlement and will sail across the Strait of Taiwan, where the Dutch East India Company, established in 1602, ended up building Fort Zealandia in Tainan. By the 1620s, we all know the Ming Dynasty was starting to wind down. 
the dynasty-long clampdown on trade at Guangzhou, plus the years of the Haijin Sea ban, were not good to the city. And as it was with the southern Song dynasty, it was the same with the demise of the Ming. After all was lost and the Manchus were on the rampage, it was in the direction of Guangzhou where the Ming emperor fled to. After the Chongzhen emperor killed himself in 1644, Ming loyalists tried in vain to keep the dynasty alive with the establishment of the southern Ming. They based themselves in Nanjing, where Zhu Yuanzhang founded the dynasty 276 years prior. But succumbing to pressure from Qing armies, they had to flee a year later in 1645 after Nanjing was taken by the Manchus. The southern Ming emperor was captured there and taken to Beijing, where he was executed. But a series of Ming pretenders to the throne and their loyal Ming followers did whatever they could, which wasn't much, to keep the fallen dynasty alive, setting up a royal court next in Fuzhou and finally from 1646 to 1647 in Guangzhou. By this time, the Ming loyalists, living on a prayer, were so desperate that when the new emperor was being coronated, they had to borrow imperial costumes from a local Cantonese opera troupe. And to make matters worse, besides this pretender to the dragon throne, another competing Ming dynasty regime was established in the city. But in January 1647, Qing forces snuffed out one of the two Guangzhou regimes, and the remaining one had to head west to the present-day capital of Guangxi province, the city of Nanning. And it took till November 1650 before Shang Keshi, after a bruising 10-month siege, took the city of Guangzhou, and for refusing to surrender quietly, another massacre took place inside the city where 70,000 people lost their lives. As for the southern Ming dynasty, that finally fell for good in 1662, 18 years after the Manchus had established the Qing dynasty. However, the most renowned of the Ming loyalists, Koxinga, Zheng Chenggong, He fought to keep the dynasty alive until his son finally surrendered to the Kangxi Emperor in 1683. So now we finally make it to the Qing Dynasty. Thus far, we've seen how the city of Guangzhou began, how it grew. We've observed in the historical context of the passing dynasties, and we looked at some of the events that occurred in and around Guangzhou and the greater Lingnan region. The one common thread running through everything is, of course, Guangzhou's role as the front door to China via the South China Sea, and its dual role as a significant port of trade and as an important military outpost for the Chinese Empire. As all of this was going on, what you had percolating in the background the entire time was the evolution of Cantonese culture that aspect of overall Lingnan culture that included Guangxi and Hainan. Though the indigenous Nanyue people's numbers never measured in the millions, there were still plenty of them. And it wasn't until the Tang Dynasty that Han migrants began to sharply outnumber them. By the end of the southern Song and into the Yuan, the Lingnan region became decidedly a Han Chinese part of the country. However, for several reasons this region evolved into something disparate than the millennia-old culture of the China Central Plain. When you think of it, how could this region not have developed into something unique and special? The geographic location and long coastline, the centuries upon centuries of foreign influences from those who came to Guangzhou for trade and for the Buddhism, when it came to new cultural influences... Guangdong province and its inhabitants, especially along the 2,700-mile-long coastline, were more outward-looking than those to the north who were much the opposite. And for this reason, the people were more apt to embrace certain aspects of these foreign influences. I mentioned that beginning in the Qin Dynasty, to travel to the south of China, to the Lingnan region, the Nanling mountain chain, didn't make it easy for anyone. We saw how the Lingchu Canal, built between 217 to 214 BC and long vanished ancient roads, connected the north of China with the Lingnan region. 
Therefore, while the Nanling Mountains weren't impenetrable, they did limit the numbers of people who migrated south. This and other historical developments helped to create this Lingnan culture that was unmistakably Chinese, yet not like what you'd see every day in the north. The food culture of Guangzhou, due to the region's proximity to the sea and all the foreign influences, developed into something unique. Ingredients that were readily available, as well as that which grew naturally on top of the famously rich and fertile soil of Guangdong, all of this that slowly developed throughout the dynasties gave us these quintessential Lingnan foods, like the Sida Mingguo, the four great fruits of the region, the lychee, banana, papaya, and pineapple. There was also the dim sum, the yum cha styles of eating, and all those dishes so many of us know and love, the tong sui, or Tang Shui desserts, the herbal liang chas, and which regional cuisine of China took the delights of seafood dishes to greater heights than the Cantonese and Chaozhounese? In other cultural aspects of China, like furniture, guangzai porcelain, and in ivory, jade, and wood carvings, so intricate and detailed were these Objects, they dazzled people from all over the world who saw them for the first time and marveled at what these southern Chinese craftsmen produced. I can remember the first time I saw those carved ivory puzzle balls, these so-called gui gong qiu, these hand-carved balls, all nested inside each other, some with as many as 20 to 25 layers of concentric hand-carved balls, all chiseled from a single piece of ivory or jade. It amazed me as much as it amazed anyone, Chinese or foreigner, who saw them for the first time. This was a Guangzhou specialty. And Lingnan Gongyi, or arts and crafts, it extended to almost every popular genre, embroidery, wood carving, in the style of calligraphy, and in music as well. Today we're familiar with canto pop, but long before this became popular, there was Cantonese opera, folk songs, poetry, and the art of storytelling. And in martial arts, too. Some of you may have listened to the CHP two-part series of the history of the Wing Chun style of Kung Fu. The look and feel of major towns and cities of the Lingnan region, too. You knew it when you saw it. The building materials, the arches, the gardens, the tanglo rows of houses. These were all defining characteristics of the region. Much of it homegrown, but also borrowed from foreign influences as well. It didn't look at all like what one might see in Luoyang or Taiyuan in the north. And of course, there's the Cantonese language itself. As spoken in and around Guangzhou, linguists have said it still carries traces of the Middle Chinese pronunciation of words, as well as linguistic traces of the language spoken by the indigenous Nanyue inhabitants. It was after the Tang Dynasty that the northern pronunciations began to shape the Cantonese language into what it ultimately became, and it's still evolving. And by the 19th century, all of what had been blending together and developing from the Tang to the Qing then got transported around the world wherever these Guangdong people migrated to, beginning in the early to mid-19th century. And in this way, for many of us not born in China, this mobile and transportable Lingnan culture became the face of Chinese culture in general to many who sought to embrace it and learn more about it. As I mentioned in part one, as a youngin growing up in the North Chicago suburbs who looked forward to each and every visit to the local Nankin restaurant on Dempster and Crawford Streets. That's all I knew. It was a chop suey joint that advertised on the book of matches they gave out by the cash register, the best in Cantonese food, and that they were, quote, famous for beef rice served in an exotic atmosphere, end quote. Eh, To a seven-year-old like me, I may as well have been dining in Haokua's palace or the residence of some Guangzhou Mandarin. The owners were Chinese immigrants transporting their Lingnan culture to America and presenting it to the locals in a way that could best make that connection. Exotic, but still familiar. Like chop suey itself. So with that, 
I'm going to suggest, rather than begin our look at Guangzhou history during the Qing Dynasty, which began in 1644, let's bring things to a close right here. I didn't want to give you the impression that the ebb and flows of each dynasty and the marquee historic events were all that was going on in Guangzhou history. There was also a cultural history that was happening alongside everything going on that I've described so far. So next time we convene, we'll continue on with more Guangzhou history. Everything happened so fast. Magellan's 1520 circumnavigation of the world, Drake's 1580 achievement of the same, and the establishment of the British East India Company in 1600, and the Dutch version in 1602, and later on the French East India Company in 1664. Yeah, the 17th and 18th centuries. The Qing rulers didn't know it yet, but... Barbarians were at the gate. That's all for next time. Okay, enough of this filler material. I'm sure some of you are grumbling. Where's the beef already? Please excuse me and my humble thanks for indulging me. This here's Laszlo Montgomery signing off as usual from the sister city of Guangzhou, Los Angeles, California. Now comes the good part. I'm hoping you think so too, and we'll consider coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.